Lord. How's everybody doing? Excellent, excellent. I want to um, um, encourage you this morning, all right? I want to encourage you this morning. Last week, we had a, a really, really, really heavy-hitting message, really, really kind of, you know, turning up the temperature on us um, because, because last week was a text about unbelief and the consequences of unbelief. Um, Jesus ends his public ministry last week in verse, in chapter 12, all right? So when we, when we shut down last week, we were shutting down in chapter 12. Jesus was basically saying um, that amongst the, uh, to the unbelievers in the room, because there was a lot of unbelievers that were gathered in the moment who had kind of lost faith or, or, or just some of them trusted but fear of man was too much, and so they loved the approval of man, loved the glory of man, and so they didn't want to budge on that. And some of them just flat out did not believe at all. Um, so here he is talking to this unbelieving crowd in chapter 12, verse 47, 48, and he says, If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. And we said that sounds comforting for the unbeliever until you get to verse 8 of verse 48. And in verse 48, he says this, the one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. So it's not a I'm not judging, you're completely off the grid, go and do whatever you want, go, if you want to believe, believe, if you don't want to believe, don't believe, it doesn't matter, because I'm not here to judge. That's not the intent of Jesus' message in verses 47 and 48 of chapter 12. The intent of Jesus' message in verses 48 and 40, uh, 47 and 48 of chapter 12 is this, the world is already on the path towards condemnation. The Bible says that the wrath of God is coming into the world, according to Colossians. The Bible says in John chapter 3 that the world, because of its sin and because it, because it loved the darkness more than the light, that it is already condemned. Adam, when he sinned in the garden and ate of the fruit in the garden, immediately sin makes its way into this world. And every single soul that has followed after has come into this world shaped and formed in sin. And so God's wrath, because God is perfect, right? And he's, and he's complete in all of his ways, perfect in all his ways, holy in all his ways, then justice requires a, 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 suitable, a suitable punishment for the crime. And we're talking about a crime against a perfect God, and so therefore sin requires a crime of eternal punishment, right? And so Jesus, we talked about last week, that Jesus talks about hell more than anybody else in the Bible. And so when Jesus says the words that he says in those two verses that we just read, let's not take him as saying that you can live however you want to live and you can worship whoever you want to worship and don't worry about it because it's, it's going to be all good at the end. Jesus was giving us a very, very, very heavy word. In fact, going as far as saying to the unbelievers there that where I'm going, you cannot go. Now, later on, he's going to say the very same thing to his disciples, but he's going to say it in such a way that indicates that they can come later. He does not say that to the unbelievers. He just simply says, I'm going back to the Father. You can't come, which is scary. So last week was a heavy heavy message. However, that's not the only message of the gospel, is it? The full picture of the gospel requires that we not ignore the reality of God's holy wrath and that we do not ignore the reality that there is an eternal punishment to come for those who do not trust in him. But it also requires that we don't overinflate it either. It also requires that we don't make that the only message that we share with people. You know, sometimes, sometimes we get into this, this, this rhythm, so to speak, as, a, as, as Christians where, where once we kind of get saved, we begin to just kind of communicate hellfire and brimstone to everybody else, right? Because it's like, hey, I'm good. I'm good. You're not, but I am, Right? So, so, so there is no message of love for you. There is no message of grace. There is no message of mercy. There's only hell, hell, hell. But that's an incomplete gospel. You tracking with that? And we find that this incomplete gospel, or we find that it's very much incomplete because what ends up happening is that we, we see his words in chapter 12. 
harsh words, very, very firm words, very strong words, and if not heated, very dangerous words. But then we see right after that, butted up against chapter 12 is chapter 13, which is a chapter filled with love, a chapter oozing with love, right? So, so, so there is terror in his wrath that is undeniable and unfathomable, but there is love for a fumbling and stumbling humanity like all the people in this room that is just as undeniable and just as unfathomable. In the same way that we can undermine God's wrath by only speaking about his grace, we can also undermine God's love by only speaking about his wrath. Does that make sense? And so we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna balance our message this morning by speaking of this overwhelming love that your Lord has loved you with. There's a Latin term for verse 34. It is mandatum, mandatum, mandatum novum do vobis, mandatum novum do vobis. And it means a new commandment I give to you. And that commandment is that you love one another. Amen? As a matter of fact, this day in church history is called Monday, Thursday. The reason it's called Monday, Thursday is because it's taken from that Latin, mandatum, the commandment, commandment Thursday. What is the great commandment that Jesus gave us on Thursday? The commandment of love. But before he gives them the commandment of love, He demonstrates what love actually looks like. See, Jesus' love is what we call agape. And agape is not the same as the love that you and I are conditioned with seeing and experiencing in this world. Agape is not based on conditions, in fact. Agape is deep and abiding. Agape is enemy overcoming. It loves in the spite of enemies. Agape is service-driven and not selfish-driven. Agape is unconditional. And it's that love that Jesus commands us to love each other with, but before he commands us to love each other with that love, he demonstrates that love to us in chapter 13. So Monday, Thursday is typically, a, 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 it typically points to the foot washing and it typically points to the supper But you should understand that this dinner that's happening on this day is pointing above all things to God's love, God's love for you. I want to talk about a couple of things. And the first thing I want to talk about is in verse one, that the king possesses a never ending love for his own. The king possesses a never-ending love for his own. Verse verse 1 in chapter 13, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The closeness of these words of deep and abiding love to the words that we read last week should be a clear message to us Never let the message of God's wrath drown out the message of God's love. You should preach both. And you should preach both with just as much ferocity as the other. He loved us all the way through to the end. What does that mean? He loved us all the way through to the cross. He loved us all the way through to his death. In other words, that means that he never wavered in his love as he was preparing to die for these people. As he was preparing to die for you. Even as he saw the stubbornness, for example, of his disciples and the disobedience of his disciples and eventually the cowardice of his disciples where they all eventually scattered away, he never ceased to love them. The Bible says that he was in the garden and, and he asked his disciples to pray for an hour with him. He told them, listen, I am sorrowful unto death. Meaning what? That I, my spirit is weak. I am the 
depressed about what I am preparing to experience. My humanity is suffering right now as I think about the cross, as I think about the wrath that's being prepared to be poured out on me in the coming days. Can you pray for me and pray with me for an hour? And what does the Bible tell us the disciples did? Within an hour, they were asleep. But never did his love cease. Even as he looked at a group of guys that couldn't even hang out and pray with him for one hour as he was preparing to die for them. He never looked at our stubbornness either. He never looked at our waver wavering either. He loved his own until the end. And so he sees you, he saw you, right? And he sees you now, and he sees you in your stumbling, he sees you in your failures, he sees you in your times where you're not nearly as faithful as you ought to be, where we're not nearly as faithful as we ought to be. He sees us when we can't control our tongues, he sees us when we can't control our attitudes, he sees us when our lust is running rampant, he sees us in all of these different conditions, and yet he loves us to the end. He sees us in all of these conditions, knowing that it is those conditions that, that is the cause and the reason for him having to experience what he suffered. And yet, he loved you to the end. Your king's love for you is never-ending and unceasing. It is unwavering. It knows no bounds, it knows no depths, it knows no heights. It just continues to go on and on and on and on. And he begins to demonstrate that. The king possesses a humble and serving love for his own. So he begins to demonstrate that in verse 3 through 11. It says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper, and he laid aside his outer garments. And taking a towel, he tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And he came to Simon Peter and he said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? I'm sorry, he came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered him, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. And Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus, ans Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Jesus talking about if I do not cleanse you from sin, you do not have any share of me. And Simon Peter, of course, he doesn't get it. Most of the time we don't when Jesus is talking. So Simon Peter says, Lord, not my feet also, but my hands and my hair. I'm, I'm about to take, take all this off right now. You just bade me. If, I, if that's what I need, and, he, and, and Jesus is like, no, that's, that's not what I'm talking about. The one who has bathed does not need to be washed. You've already been bathed, except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you, for he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. Now, listen, listen, let me start here. Jesus demonstrates an unbelievable love through his service to his own. He's serving them in this moment. But the service begins with the investment of time. And this is important for this room. This is important for this day. This is important for this culture because we're all hurried. We're all rushed. We are all being shuttled from, from, from moment to moment to moment, right? Nobody has any time to stop. But Jesus begins his service with this initial investment in time or of time by just simply sitting with these men and dining with them. His discipling is done in the context of fellowship and community. Jesus' discipling is not merely instructional. As a matter of fact, some of the theologians say that, that Jesus ate his way through the gospel. When you read through the Gospels, you see countless times where Jesus is having a meal. Even after he is resurrected in his glor glorified body in need of nothing, he's like, hey, you get, let's get this catfish dinner going. <laughs> Probably not what he, how he said it, but it's my interpretation of that. But he's resurrected and he's still having meals. He's still sitting and feasting and dining. 
When you look through the Gospels, you see time and time and time again where discipleship is happening in the context of community, people spending time with each other. Second John, in the, in, the, in, the, in the second epistle that John writes to the church, he says, there's a lot of things that I could write to you and tell you, but I'm going to wait till I can come and see you. That way our joy may be full or may be complete. John believes that, yeah, it's good to write each other or text each other, but John believes that fellowship is something, there's something in fellowship missing when I don't have time to sit with you face to face. And so Jesus is saying, before I even begin in talking about how I'm serving you, just the idea of us having this meal allows me to serve you. See, love never exists in isolation. You can't live isolated lives and expect to walk in love because you have nobody to love. One of the most significant roles of the local church is to be a place where you can honor this commandment by giving you opportunities to give and receive love. That's why we have missional community. That's why we have Wednesday night meals together and Sunday night meals together because it gives you an opportunity. That's why we tell you go and form DNA groups where it's just two or three of you guys to build relationship together or go out and go painting like the ladies did last, uh, last week or go out and go watch a movie like the fellas did last week because it gives you an opportunity to love. You can't love in isolation. The only person you can love in isolation is you. So community and fellowship has to be the starting ground to begin to demonstrate love. What about the actual feet washing? John understands the weight of this feet washing. That's why he says in verse 3, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, he had come from God and was going back to God. In other words, John is talking about the authority of Jesus. He says Jesus has everything. Does that make sense? All things are in his hands. And as he begins to, he's setting the stage for us to understand the depths, the depths that Jesus has to descend in order to demonstrate this love. Here's a God with everything in his hands. He is the high, at the highest of heights. And yet, he takes off his outer garment and he grabs a towel. And he presumes or he, he, he assumes the position taking on the task of the most humiliating task you could possibly do in that day and time. Feet washing. So humiliating that, that the slaves were given the task of feet washing in many, in many households only if they were not Jewish. Jewish people wouldn't allow their Jewish slaves to participate in feet washing. They only allowed the Gentile slaves to do it. That's how humiliating this task was. And here is the one who owns all. All things have been given into, uh, all things have been given to him. He takes off the robe, and then he begins to wash feet. Does it make sense? Jesus takes on an act that shocks his apostles. This is a task that 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 is so so debasing that they, that they are surprised and Peter's surprised. He says, no, 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 you're not gonna, you're not gonna do this for me. And I understand why. I understand why they would be shocked. Excuse me. I understand why they would be shocked. It's because this is my Lord. This is my Savior. You're not gonna take on this task for me. That might be my initial response, right? Matter of fact, it, I mean, this is normally, this is, this is an act for us that is so unusual because we have grown so accustomed to being served, right? And so we don't see our Lord and Savior as serving. We say, hey, he's supposed to, one, he's supposed to be the one being served at all times. And we can't even process what he's doing in this moment. He's setting an example for us, though. As a matter of fact, what's interesting about this task is that it's supposed to be done at the beginning when people first arrive. And so what this is showing us is that there's been, he, he breaks supper to do this task, which means that none of the other disciples ever thought to do it, right? They're all just there to be served. 
They haven't figured out who's going to do it. They haven't figured out if they're going to get somebody else to do it. Nobody's thought about it. The only, person, the only person in the room thinking about doing this is Jesus, the king of the universe. Everybody else is just kind of hanging out and ready to be served. Doesn't that sound like church, by the way? Everybody in the room just ready to be served, right? Nobody's thinking about serving except Jesus, right? The rest of us are kind of like, uh, I don't know. You know, I mean, do, do they have good coffee? Ah, okay, maybe we'll go. <laughs> you know? I mean, that's, that's how we perceive church these days, right? But Jesus, not only does he wash feet, but then he takes the step of instructing us in what he just did. So he says in verse 13 or verse 12, when he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than the master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So Christian love should include a posture of humility, a posture of service that the watching world observes, sees, and oftentimes considers very unnecessary and very unusual. You're going to lower yourself to that standard? You're going to do that for them? Why are, you spending, why, are you, why are you spending all that time for them doing that and doing this? You don't have to do that. You don't owe those people anything. You saw the way that guy treated you. You don't owe him kindness. Do you understand? It should look to the watching world like all, almost humiliating, but this is exactly what Jesus says. This is what it means to walk in the footsteps of your master. Do you think that the only thing Jesus was talking about in this moment was everybody get a bucket and wash feet? No. He was setting an example as to how we are to serve each other in this world. Think about the fact that this is in the final hours of Jesus where he's doing this. He's winding down his life. Typically, when people are winding down in life, they're looking to be served, aren't they? When do we give death row inmates their favorite meal? The last days. Hey, man, you about to get out of here, man. You want to stay? Jesus is on his way out and looking to serve. Love that doesn't drive you towards deep, self-demoting, self-sacrificing, others elevating service is only an illusion of love. Now, it's not our natural being, and so it's going to be spirit and power, and you're going to have to pray to walk in it. And you're not going to walk in it all the time, so you're going to have to seek forgiveness from the Lord and just, and just stand, in the, stand in the grace that comes from his perfect work on the cross when we fail. But it is what we're called to do. But no, it's not natural. When, 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 Pew, when Pew surveys, asks people, what are they looking for in a church when they are looking to join a church? They had 83% said the quality of the sermons. And I said, uh-oh, our church is in trouble. But then, they, but then they said 79% feeling welcomed by the leaders and 74% the style of the service. So the music, is the music good? And 70% the location, where is it? Is it easy to get to? And 56% the education for the kids and, and 48% whether or not they got friends there. And, and then 42% whether or not they got volunteer opportunities. That was the lowest of, lowest of all of them. It was like down here. So it's like, hey, you know, I want to see if they're going to do something for me. They got some good sermons for me. They got good kids programs for me. The location is convenient for me. If me and me and me and me and me and me and me. Oh, and if there's something for them, something for me to do, eh, you know, maybe. It might be a good church. It might not be. So it's not natural to us, right? We're always looking to be served. And Jesus is saying, in order to walk in the master's footsteps, you have to look to serve. Let 
If you declare your love for the saints around you, I'll ask you in what ways are you committed to serving them? A love that only leaves time and room for you to be served is a love not known by Jesus. It's a love not taught by Jesus. And it's it's partially the church's fault because we condition the people of God to think in these terms. We condition our churches to be places where the only thing people can do is be served. And we're never encouraging people to go and serve, but that's what God is encouraging us to do. Amen. As his bride. Verse 21, it says, after saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And the disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at the table of Jesus, at Jesus' side. So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking, so that the disciple leaning back against Jesus said to him, so Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered, it is he to whom I give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. And so when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas the son of Simon Iscariot. Then, after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered him. Jesus said to him, what you are going to do, do quickly. Now, no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Jesus had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. There's a lot of things that we can pull from Judas's life. But one of the things that we can pull from Judas's life is that the king possesses a love that overcomes his enemies. Jesus shows a deep and abiding love for his most notorious human enemy in all of the scriptures narrative, Judas. You say, well, wait a second. I don't even, how do you know that? Well, let's consider. There is never any indication to Judas that Jesus knew about him. Judas thought he was getting away with it, right? He's thinking the whole time that he's getting away with it, Judas, Judas, the disciples are thinking the whole time that Judas Judas is one of them. Matter of fact, Jesus gives them the morsel and the disciples are like, okay, what's going on here, right? Go Go do what you have planned to do. Judas walks out the door. Nobody says, oh, that's the guy, right? Nobody says any of that. They're, they're thinking, oh, he must got some business to take care of for Jesus. Why is that? It's because Jesus loved him like he loved all of them. Do you understand? I mean, I mean, think about this in terms of just your human interactions, right? Think about this even at your job. You got somebody that's, you got somebody that's scheming on you at your job. How do you treat them? You don't treat them like everybody else, do you? Be honest. Be honest. And if you're even more honest, people know that you don't treat them like everybody else. Hey, Bob. Hey, man, how was your week? How was your week? Hey, Johnny, man, good week. All right. Hey, Jack. Hey, man, what's up? (laughs) Jack knows you don't like him. Bobby knows you don't like Jack. Everybody knows you don't like Jack. And so Judas, nobody knows that Judas is the betrayer. And the reason nobody knows is because Jesus treats and loves him the exact same. When all of these these disciples are here having their feet washed, you know who's amongst them? Judas, having his feet washed. The one who was preparing to walk out of the door and to set up the course that leads to his death is having his feet washed by the Savior. Jesus even gives him the responsibility of handling the money. You know you wouldn't let that guy handle your money. And Jesus gives him the responsibility of handling the money. He treats him no differently. Matthew 5 says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. He knows what it means to call you to love your enemies because he loved his enemies. Do 
you understand? Before we were children of mercy, he loved us. And so he knows what it means to love his enemies because the Bible says that before God called you out of darkness, you were children of wrath. The Bible says that fellowship with the world is enmity with God. In other words, we were, as lovers of the world, enemies of God, and God loved you before you loved him. He knows what it means to love his enemies. And so when he calls you to love his enemies, he is calling you from experience. How do you love your enemies? How do you love your enemies? Maybe your Bible beliefs has placed you in the crosshairs of people. They don't like you because of the positions that you take in Christianity, the positions you take in worldview ethics, the way you see sexuality, or the way you see whatever, politics, or whatever is going on in your life. But there may be some enemies that, 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 that have been forged around you. How do you love them, though? Do you exhibit the kind of kindness that is practically indistinguishable from your friends. That's the kind of spirit-empowered love for enemies that God is calling us to walk in. Does that make sense? The kind of love that literally is indistinguishable from friends. We treat them nice no matter who they are. Even as opportunities to serve comes up, we serve them. That's what Jesus was talking about when he says, hey, if the guy takes your, takes your cloak, offer him your jacket. God makes you, forces you to walk one mile, walk two with him. Talks about returning evil for kindness. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago, but the civil rights movement, one of the things that advanced the movement was not that people went to the streets and spewed hatred in retaliation, with, uh, in retaliation to hatred. Dr. King said only love could drive out hate. So one of the things that you saw was a weaponizing of love. Love is a powerful, powerful weapon. Far more powerful than any tool that you can mold. Powerful than any hateful word that you feel like you can spew. You now sometimes we feel like, oh, I, 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 no, nah, no, nah, it's not, it's not going to get right until I set them right, right? And so, and so we feel like, and we, we feel like that love is not going to get it, that I'm going to have to give them something. It's going to it's gonna have to be filled with some cuss words. And if I, if I give them that, then they'll get right. But rarely does that ever happen. You just hate each other more. Jesus shows us how to weaponize love in his love towards Judas. If we are to look to Jesus for an example of our love, then it seems that more often than not, Christians should be known by a love for their enemies that surpasses even their enemies' own friends' love for them. If we were to leave here today and check our Facebook accounts, what would I, what would I learn about your love for your enemies? But then he says this in verse 31. He says, when he had gone out, Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. So the king is now beginning to command, we're getting to the command of love. As a matter of fact, in verse 33, it says, little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me. And just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. These are words shaped by his coming glory or by his glorification. He's being glorified, and as he's being glorified and honored by God the Father, he's thinking about this commandment. This is words shaped by his departure. As he's preparing to leave, Talking to, as a father would talk to children, little children, he says to them. In other words, in other words, it's like a father that has only a limited amount of time with children that, that are immature, right? That are not necessarily quite ready, but that he has to leave. So what is that father going to give them to prepare them for his absence? Little children. 
How am I going to prepare you for my departure? By telling you to love one another. Because that's what you need. In this reckless world, in this dark world, in this world that has so many obstacles that are, that are pressing in against you, what will you need? You will need to love each other. You're not going to be able to stand in isolation and survive the onslaught of the devil. You're not going to be able to stand in your corner, right, and, and, and be able to survive the onslaught of the devil and the highs and the lows that come from being in this world and the suffering that comes from being in this world and the illnesses that come from the sin that, 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 has been all, that goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden in this world, in the, in the, in the depression and the loneliness and the violence and the death and the, and, the, and the animosity and the bickering and the anger. You're not going to be able to survive any of that without loving each other. You're going to need one another when I'm gone. The command is a command to love, but he has demonstrated what that love looks like before he gave us that command, right? That's what all those verses before were for. Let your love be enduring, right? He loved us to the end. Let your love be enduring. Through the heartaches, through the brokenness, through the messiness of human relationships, when you want to quit on each other, right? When somebody, when somebody volunteered and they and, and volunteered to bring the chicken plate, right? And they didn't come through and mess and messed up your whole church meal, right? <laughs> Love to the end. Are you tracking with that? When somebody said something and you thought that that was between y'all and, and all of a sudden so-and-so knows about it. How does so-and-so know about it? Love to the end. He's taught us how to love. He teaches us how to love by washing our feet. In other words, let your love be filled with humility and service, seeking to serve the other. Not seeing yourself as so high and mighty that you can't get down in the dirt with others. To demonstrate love. Let your love be a weapon against your enemies, not your hatred. He shows us how to love. When your enemies are rising up against you, don't respond in kind, respond in love. So he doesn't command us without showing us exactly how we're supposed to be walking in it. And he says that if you do that, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That's your defense of the faith. Your defense of the faith is not how much truth you know, even though truth is important. Your defense of the faith is how much truth that you, that you um, connect with love. If people, if people hear you preaching, but they don't see you loving, you're not defending your faith. If people hear you preaching, but they don't see any love behind it, you're not defending your faith. It's your love that people see with the truth that says, yeah, those people are called by God. Let me close by saying this, verse 36 and 38. He says to Peter, or Peter rather, says to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me, but you will follow, hard, uh, but you will follow afterward. So it's the same thing that we remember I told you in chapter 12. He says, hey, I'm going somewhere. Y'all can't come. The unbelievers can't come. But he tells Peter, I'm going somewhere, but you can come later, right? So he says in verse 37, Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay my life down for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. So Peter thinks that his love is mature. And Jesus says, it's not even close yet, Peter. Peter misses the point. You know, he, here's Jesus preparing them, walking them through a demonstration of love and then encouraging them to love. Except Peter doesn't even hear the love part. He hears the part that Jesus is about to leave. He's like, where are you going? It's like, no, 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 Peter. That, that wasn't, that wasn't the, the point of all of this. The point of all of this was the love part. And Peter's like, well, pff, I got that, man. What, what are you talking about? I'm ready to die right now for you. And then we, we, if, you, if you've ever read, read the scripture, you know the story. There's only a couple of days 
ahead of us, Peter's going to find himself with golden opportunities to show his allegiance to Jesus. And he fails every single time, three times, in fact. Every single time, hey, you know, you know that guy that they're about to put on the cross? No, I don't know. I've never seen him. Goes as far as beginning to spew out curses to people that try to pair him with Jesus and say, I think, I think you were with him. So Jesus, when he comes back to Peter after his resurrection, what does Jesus do? Jesus doesn't correct his, necessarily correct the faith walk, because Peter knew who Jesus was. When Jesus asked, who do men say that I am? It was Peter who cried out, you are the son of God. So Peter knows who Jesus is. That wasn't the problem. So Jesus corrects Peter's love walk. He asked Peter three times, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Because that was the deficiency in Peter. He thought he had it together, just like we think we have it together most, most days. Most of, most of the time we say, um, I love everybody. Isn't that, your, isn't that your response, right? It's mine. Hey, I love everybody. I can't stand so-and-so. But I love everybody. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? And so Peter thinks this, this love walk is perfect, and Jesus is, he's, he's showing him, no, nah, you're not there yet. But here's the beauty about that. The cross covers our imperfections in love. The reason why Peter can get to, the, 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 the reason why Peter finds himself in front of Jesus when Jesus is resurrected and finds Jesus correcting him in his deficiencies it's not because Peter is going to love perfect. The reason why he finds himself being corrected and restored by Jesus is because of what Jesus did on Calvary. The cross covers us in our indeficiencies. So I don't want you to walk out of here in despair, okay? Because you're going to walk out of here today, and this is a high call, right? Jesus has given us a high standard, and I want you to pursue it by God's grace and with his spirit. Go and pursue it and let the world see what the church really looks like. But know that when you fail, you have a Savior who loved you, who loves you, loved you so much that he covers your imperfections in love, loved you so much that he died for your failures of love. And let his love energize you to love more. Let him overlooking your faults energize you to overlook the faults of another. Let his grace and mercy demonstrated towards you energize and fuel you to demonstrate grace and mercy towards others. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. God, we are grateful and thankful for the privilege that we have to, to learn of you. I'm grateful for the privilege of being able to understand love by watching your love for us. I'm grateful for the privilege to understand love through service and love as a weapon towards our enemies and, and grateful for the privilege of seeing endless love. Father, help us honor you in the commandment to love each other well in order that the world may see our love and know that you are there and that you are real and that you are present. And Father, when we fail to operate in that love, may we find mercy and grace at the cross Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we give you the praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name.